Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Oh, there's a wonderful spirit of praise and worship here in the sanctuary. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. It's a privilege and an honor to be here tonight to speak to you. Thank you for the privilege of letting me serve as general superintendent. I don't take it lightly, and I hope that I'm doing the will of God and staying in the will of God. I've been blessed by every part of this service, as everyone has done an excellent job. And, of course, my wife and several of my kids were involved, and my pastor in, high, in uh, college, Brother D, said never to say you're proud, so I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for their, that they're serving God. That's truly much more important than being general superintendent. And I appreciate Brother Jones and Brother Mooney, Brother Gleason, our leaders, our general board. It's good to have the general superintendent of the Assemblies of the Lord Jesus Christ, Brother Carpenter, and his wife with us. Amen. It's good to have Jay and Carol Barrington with us, our auditor for many years, helping keep us straight. They're our special guests tonight. And there are many other special guests that we won't take time to mention, but we are celebrating, if you haven't figured it out, the centennial of the Jesus Name movement. Now, we believe that we go back to the New Testament church. We're not trying to invent something new. But we are thankful that there was a great renewal and revival a hundred years ago of apostolic Pentecostal message and experience. And so tonight, I'm not going to try to do something strange. In fact, you may hear some echoes of things you've already heard, and that's okay. Because I think it's important for us to celebrate and reaffirm our identity as a movement. That must be front and center of who we are. We should never get tired of preaching about the name of Jesus, the apostolic doctrine, the apostolic way of life. That's why we exist as the United Pentecostal Church International. In that regard, I want to read a letter before I give a text. This letter, I will read almost the whole letter, but omit a few identifying remarks. And I'm not saying that every phrase of this letter I would personally write, but I think this message speaks to us. It's written by a Trinitarian Pentecostal pastor who's not obviously part of our fellowship, but he's attended a number of our services over the years. And listen carefully to what he says. Dear Brother Bernard, you do not know me, sir. I am not a member of your organization. I have been an ordained minister for almost 40 years and pastored a fine church for the last 37 years. I'm writing you today to do more than express my appreciation for the many occasions that your organization permitted us to participate in special events, but to state an observation which your leadership may not fully comprehend. Every Pentecostal organization is in a state of upheaval because of an escalating trend. Leadership in these denominations, as well as my own, has been deluded into believing that the faith once delivered to the saints is increasingly irrelevant in the modern era. Consequently, all the Pentecostal distinctives are vanishing from the religious landscape in America. The rush to imitate the success of pastors who built their religious enterprises the rush is to imitate the success of pastors who built their religious enterprises on compromise, accommodation, and political correctness. I'm certain that in your position you are far more informed of the current apostasy than I am. But I wanted you to know that there are many of us who look upon the UPCI as the last holdout of Pentecostal worship, Pentecostal prayer, Pentecostal preaching, and Pentecostal anointing. I believe the Lord wants to speak to us tonight. The only reason for this letter is to encourage you as a truly Pentecostal leader to resist the trends, methodology, and philosophies which have corrupted so many. 
I pray that the UPCI will always be spirit-led, evangelistic instead of entertainment-centered, and always more spiritual than intellectual. I pray that your movement will never replace the preaching of the word with a motivational lecture from a would-be pop psychologist or life coach peddling the latest verbal therapy for raising a person's self-esteem. Truly, the time left for us to minister is fading fast. And if, this is not me speaking, if the UPCI is the only remaining vessel which refuses to be polluted with the popular godlessness of these times, may the Lord freshly pour out of you the pure oil of His Spirit on a church culture and lost world in desperate need of revival. That's why we're here. We're not here to condemn or attack anyone else. Let me be clear, the UPCI has no corner on truth. We don't believe that God works only through us. We recognize God moves all around the world in many ways, every country. I believe He works in various groups to lead to truth, to inspire, to anoint. We're not here to attack. That's not the point. We're not here to claim exclusivism. That's not the point. But we're here to say, if God is indeed using us, we better be who God has called us to be. This is no time to change who we are. This is no time to imitate somebody else. This is time for the Holy Ghost filled, Jesus name, holiness, apostolic, Pentecostal church to be what God has called us to be in this last hour. Praise God. Praise God. Unless you think that letter is out of left field. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch, September 2nd, 2013. They did not interview anybody at our headquarters, but this is the title of their article. Pentecostals edge away from speaking in tongues. And they gave statistics of a large organization saying they had the lowest number of people spirit-filled speaking in tongues that they've recorded since 1995. So it's not just someone out in left field saying, I think changes are going on. This is now the subject of the newspaper, that the Pentecostals are changing. But I'm here to say we need to stand firm on our identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll just make this note in passing for what it's worth. Truth is a seamless whole. When you start picking at one piece, the damage is not contained to one piece. It unravels the whole garment. I get disturbed when people say, I believe the doctrine, but I don't believe the standards. We understand that principles must be applied in different cultures in different ways. But the principles and teachings of God's Word are not optional extras. Our Christian lifestyle is part of our doctrine. It's part of our identity. We're not teaching superfluous extras. At least I hope you're not in your church. We are teaching what we firmly to believe to be the Word of God. If we compromise one piece, it takes us further than we intended to go, and it will make us pay more than we intended to pay. The best policy is stick with the Word of God and godly convictions and godly leadership as we know it and understand it, as God has revealed it to us, let's stand for apostolic truth. Praise God. I'm going to read from Acts chapter 3. If you'd like to stand, I'm going to be using a lot of Scripture, but at least perhaps we might want to stand for this one passage. In Acts chapter 3, the story of the lame man at the gate of the temple. Acts 3 verse 6. Then... Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You know the story, the lame man was healed, began walking, leaping and praising God. The crowds gathered and then notice verse 16, the first half, 
the Apostle Peter explained to the crowd what happened. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong whom ye see and know. I want to preach for a little while. I've asked the Lord to anoint me beyond my ability. Whatever I can do, I don't want to do that. I want to do what the Lord wants me to do. I'm preaching in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Praise God. You may be seated. The story of, is told of Thomas Aquinas well-known scholar of the Middle Ages, he visited Rome for the first time. He was overwhelmed by the churches, the magnificence, the treasures, the, the, the amazing prosperity of the medieval church. Pope Innocent IV noticed this reaction with somewhat amusement that such a scholar would be so impressed uh, with the magnificence of the church. And so he remarked with a smile, we can no longer say what Peter and John said, silver and gold have I none. Thomas Aquinas quickly replied, but neither can we say to the lame, rise and walk. That should be a sobering thought. I am thankful for the blessings on the UPCI. We ought to be in every country around the world. We ought to have a payroll of millions of dollars to support our missionaries. It does require a massive amount of investment to do the work that God has called us to do in the 21st century. So I'm not worried about that. But I'm concerned about in everything we do, we can get along without a lot of things. But we must have the name of Jesus. And we must have the power of God. We must be noted as the people of the name. And it's got to be more than a label. It's got to be more than a formula. We must have the power of God working in our lives and in our churches. I'm preaching in the name of Jesus. I'm not preaching about merely a formula. It's not a set of magical words. Peter explained it clearly. It's his name through faith in his name. Acts chapter 19 shows us very clearly what we're talking about. There were some Jewish leaders who decided to cast a demon out of a person. And so they listened carefully to the message of the Apostle Paul. They approached this spirit and said, We adjure you in the name of the Jesus that Paul preaches. They had the right name. They had the right formula. But the demon spoke out. Uh, And the man leaped upon them, beat them up, stripped them, and left them fleeing naked for their lives. The demons said, Jesus, I know. The demons do tremble at the sound of the name of Jesus. They do believe in one God, and they tremble at the thought of God bringing justice and judgment in their realm. And the demons said, Paul, I know. Do you realize the demonic world does know the people that know Jesus? The demons know and respect apostolic ministry. But of course, the next phrase was, but who are you? They didn't have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They did not have faith in his name. We must know the Lord for ourselves. When we walk the streets of our city, when we drive down the highways, do the demons, as it were, stand back and say, stay out of the way, don't store them up, leave them alone? Or do they shrug their shoulders, in essence, and say, well, just another hypocrite. He's got the label, but don't worry about him. What's our reputation in the realm of the spirit? I'm not so concerned about our reputation in the natural, but we must be where it counts in the supernatural realm, in heaven and earth and under the earth. We must be known as those who bow to the lordship of Jesus Christ, who are called by his name and who walk in his name. What made the early church, the early church was the identity of Jesus Christ. The New Testament church arose out of the Jewish community. The Jews believed strongly, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. They were committed to that truth. But what made the early church different from that group? They had an encounter with Jesus. Their lives were transformed by Jesus Christ. They can never be the same. When they repented of their sins, they were baptized in the name of Jesus and filled with His Spirit. That marked them as different. Why were they no longer just another sect of Judaism? It was because they took on the name. 
They were not pagans because they served only one God. But they were no longer simply Jews because they bore the name. They were told you can preach what you want but just omit the name. But that was the key mark of identity. They were willing to suffer persecution for the sake of the name. Because what made the early church different from the rest of the world around them was precisely the name of Jesus. They came out of a Jewish exclusive monotheism that taught one God for Israel. And it became a universal monotheism from an ethnic monotheism to a universal. What am I saying? It's because they recognized the one true God of Israel was not just remote and lofty, but he had come into our world in flesh. And now he was a God of all nations. Now he was a God that's accessible. Now he's a God that walked in flesh. What made the early church what they were was Jesus Christ and that is what makes our church today now you have probably heard some of the things I'm going to say you may even heard me teach on this but if you look in the Word of God the key point of identity was the name of Jesus if you study in the Old Testament the significance of the divine name God's name represents his identity it represents his character. To know God's name is to know God. To know God's name is to know what he is like, what his character is like. We see this in Exodus chapter 3, the very foundational event that forged Israel as a nation and really was the basis of the Old Covenant, which underlies the Old Testament. God spoke to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 from the burning bush and said, I want you to go to Pharaoh, face the mightiest king of your world, face him down and deliver my people Israel from bondage in Egypt. Moses quite naturally recoiled from this impossible task and he said, who am I to do such a thing? It's interesting, God did not give him a lecture in self-esteem. It's okay, Moses, you can do it. You can do more than your thing. You're brave, you're strong. No, God in essence says, well, come to think of it, Moses, you're right. You don't have much to offer, but here's the difference. I will be with you. And so the logical question is, well, God, uh, who are you? Now, he phrased it in terms of the people. Who shall I say is sending me? But he needed the, the affirmation for himself. And that's where God said in Exodus 3 and 14, I am that I am. You just tell the people, I am has sent you. We know from studying Hebrew that Jehovah or Yahweh is from the Hebrew word to be, meaning he is. So when God's people call on him, they say he is. But when God speaks for himself, he says, I am. In other words, I am and always will be. I am the eternal one. God alone does not draw his life from anything else. Everyone else has to qualify their existence. I am because of this. I am if, when, and so forth. But God simply says, I am. The self-existent one. The ever-living one. I am my own source of life. I am my own source of power. I don't need anything else or anybody else. I am who I am. Every other title, no matter how magnificent, actually is very limiting. Perhaps the most powerful title in the world today, I'm not so sure, but probably still President of the United States. But to say Barack Obama is the President of the United States is a very limiting title because it becomes immediately obvious he's not the President of Russia, he's not the President of Syria, he's not the President of Iran. God has no such limiting titles. He simply says, I am. Perhaps you'd like to put a blank line because God can be whatever he wants to be. God can be whatever his people need him to be. If we're struggling with sin, he says, I am the Savior. If you're sick in your body or your mind, he says, I am your healer. If you're hungry tonight, he says, I am the bread of life. If you're thirsty, I am the living water. If you need direction, I am the light of the world. I am the rock. I am the king. I am the judge. I am the first, I am the last, and that means I am everything else in between. Oh, hallelujah, praise God. I am who I am. You see, when you know God's name, you know who he really is. Exodus chapter 3, God elaborated on that revelation of the name. 
in verse 6. He told Moses in continuation of this point. He says, I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Verse 6, wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. That means Jehovah. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Notice what he's saying. I don't think he's saying Abraham didn't know the name Jehovah. Because according to Genesis, Abraham did use that name. But what he is saying, Abraham understood me as the Almighty God. When he called Jehovah, when he spoke of Jehovah, he thought of the Creator, the Father, the Lord of all, the Ruler, the Almighty One. But he had never had an occasion to be in bondage and need deliverance. He did not know what all I was capable of doing because he never experienced it. But from now on, when you Israelites speak of Jehovah, you won't just say, oh, that's our creator. Oh, that's our heavenly father. No, you will say, that's the God when we were in bondage, he brought us out. That's the God who delivered us. That's the God who gave us a second chance. That's the God who made us a new people. That's the redeeming God, the deliverer. God to know his name is to know that he is the deliverer that he is the redeemer that he is the savior God's name is associated with his power I'll I'll be quick here tonight with these points but in Exodus chapter 9 God gave a message to Pharaoh through Moses. He said, I raised you up for this purpose, Pharaoh. If you would have listened to me, I could have shown my greatness in a wonderful way. But since you resisted me, I still will show my greatness. And so he explained in Exodus 9 and 16. He told the message. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up. For to show in thee my power. And that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. His name is associated with his power. And that actually happened when the spies came into the promised land. They went to the house of Rahab. She said, we've heard about your God. We heard what he did to Pharaoh. We heard what he did to your enemies. His name was associated with his power. Praise God. His name is also associated with his authority. He told Israel, I will send you an angel to lead you. And most scholars think that angel was actually a manifestation of God and thus it's capitalized in the text but if you read in Exodus 23 and 21 God said beware of him and obey his voice provoke him not for he will not pardon your transgressions for my name is in him if we possess God's name we have his power but we also have his authority to act according to his will I don't have time to go into all that, but one more point I'll make. When Solomon prayed the prayer of dedication at the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8, he made this significant statement. He said, God, I know you can't be confined to this earth. You can't even be confined to heaven. Even the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. So how could this little house do anything? But he said, wait just a minute. Of this house you said, my name will be here. When we come into this house and pray in your name, I ask that you reveal your glory, that you manifest your presence, that you hear our prayer. God's name is where he manifests his glory. It's where he reveals his presence. Yes, God is omnipresent, but when we gather in his name and we call his name in faith, something happens. We have the very attention of Almighty God. His glory fills the house even as it did at that dedication prayer. In the New Testament, we see the same thing. I may have messed up these people with the slides, so they just have to do the best they can. I'm not really sure. But in the New Testament, the Saul of Tarsus, he was a Jew who believed in one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He believed that he was doing the will of God by persecuting the Christians. But on the road to Damascus, God struck him with a light from heaven, blinded him, arrested him in effect. Paul, Saul knew he was dreadfully wrong in his thinking, so he went back to the basics. It's a good thing to find out what the foundation is. The foundation is who is your God? What is his name? He said, who are you, Lord? I thought I knew, but I'm wrong. The Lord did not say, well, the premise of your question is off. There are really several of us up here. I need to introduce you to several more. That's not what he said. 
He said the premise is right. Deuteronomy 6.4 is still right. You need a fresh revelation. And I'm going to give you a name that will tell you how your God is working today. God said from heaven, I am Jesus. The very one you're persecuting is the one you should be worshiping. A revelation of the name of Jesus. If you read the Acts accounts carefully, there's three of them, you will find he saw a vision of the resurrected and glorified Christ. And that's why he could say with such confidence, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15. That's why he could say, Colossians 2.9, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's why he could say in 2 Corinthians 4, 6 that God has shown a light, the knowledge of the glory of the gospel of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This church was founded on a revelation of the Almighty God through the name of Jesus Christ. And so the name of Jesus represents God's character, God's power, God's authority, God's presence. You can do your own research and prove that. But the name of Jesus literally means Jehovah Savior. Yahweh is salvation. All that God revealed himself to be in the Old Testament is incorporated in Jesus with this one great revelation. The God of the Old Testament, our Heavenly Father and Creator, has become our Savior in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. What I'm saying, there's salvation in the name of Jesus. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, Acts 2.21. He quoted from Joel, for Joel the Lord was Jehovah, but the apostle Peter just made the transition that Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New. He preached in Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in the other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He preached to the Gentiles, Acts 10.43, in his name, whoever believes in him should receive remission of sins. I'm here to say salvation is in the name of Jesus. We're right to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's how the world is saved, in the name of Jesus. I'll tell you something else. There's holiness in the name of Jesus. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. We're not denying God and the Father, but we're exalting the name of Jesus because God has chosen that name as the name of revelation. But let me say this. As a pastor, I had guidelines for leadership and public ministry, very similar to our Articles of Faith, only more specific and detailed in certain areas. And those guidelines for leadership were not just for preachers. It wasn't just licensed ministers, but everyone who had a public role. And it wasn't just for them. It was the model for every mature saint. That was the expectation for the church. So I believe in that. We have guidelines for ministers. I believe in that. We've got to have guidelines. We've got to be specific about what we expect. But let me say this, and you don't have to read anything to it. You just take this. No rule can solve the problems of the human heart. But there is something higher than any rule, and it's the name of Jesus. Let me tell you what I mean. When it comes to prayer, we say we should pray in Jesus' name. That's right. Prayer is word and deed. When we baptize, we say we should baptize in Jesus' name. That's right. It's both word and deed. But don't limit this verse to that. But when you sit down and have a conversation with your ministerial friend, can you do it in a way that's compatible with the invocation of the name of Jesus in that conversation? When you read a book, when you surf online, when you sit down and watch some kind of DVD with your family, can you do so in a way that's compatible with the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ? Jesus' name represents his manifested presence. It represents his divine glory. Whatever we do, wherever we go, whatever conversation, whatever activity, if I'm alone, just by myself, can I do what I'm doing in a way that's consistent with glorifying and uplifting and harboring the name of Jesus? 
if we took that seriously, that would be more strict than anything we can imagine. In fact, I don't mind telling you, I can easily live up to pretty much any rule we pass, but I'm still striving to live up to what I just said. Is everything I do consistent with the name of Jesus? Is everything I do consistent with invoking the blessing of the Lord on my activity or my speech or my attitude or my spirit? That's why I say holiness is going to be found in the name of Jesus. Not in a formula, but in understanding that name and knowing who he really is. Evangelism is in that name. Luke 24, 47, remission, repentance and remission of sins would be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Why are we so intent on reaching every nation with the gospel? Why do we push so hard to reach every city, every town, every individual? Because we believe every human being needs to know the name of Jesus. Not just to hear it, but we believe they need a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. We really do believe the whole gospel to the whole world by the whole church. And our motivating factor is the name of Jesus. If it wasn't for the name, there are plenty of people that are doing good around the world. They don't need us. But we have the name. In the name of Jesus. I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. What does God want to do in the next few minutes? I was reading Frank Ewart. You heard a little synopsis a hundred years ago at that very occasion when he baptized Glenn Cook. Glenn Cook baptized him. A mighty revival began in Los Angeles. Listen to what Frank Hewitt wrote. One of the greatest, most startling characteristics of that great revival was that the vast majority of the new converts were filled with the Holy Ghost after coming up out of the water. They would leave the tank speaking in other tongues. Many were healed when they were baptized. If we would preach the name of Jesus in its full significance, you're going to see that happen in your church today. I've seen people delivered of drugs coming up out of the waters of baptism. I've seen people healed coming up out of the waters of baptism. I'm preaching in the name of Jesus. It's still happening today. Oh, hallelujah. We are here because of that kind of revival a hundred years ago. That's why we're here today. Let me just give you a few examples. Venezuela, our second largest mission field, last year added 199 churches and 200 preaching points. 399 new works in one year. It can happen. Pakistan, our fourth largest field, 160,000 constituents in a Muslim environment. A Middle Eastern country that I will not name, we didn't have any works there. In fact, it is illegal in that country to convert to Christianity, and it's illegal to try to convert someone. You can receive the death penalty for both. But God did a sovereign work. An immigrant from that country was converted in Canada. He had a burden to reach his people. He began preaching online. He contacted people. Now he works full-time teaching and preaching online online. He tells the people, don't tell anyone outside your immediate family, but in your home at the designated times, have church and I'll preach to you online. He says, when you're ready to be baptized, take a vacation to a neighboring country. We'll meet you there and we'll baptize you in Jesus' name. Recently, we conducted an online crusade in that language with several preachers preaching. In the online crusade, 42 of those native speakers received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Even the internet can be sanctified in the name of Jesus. A follow-up tour to the neighboring countries resulted in 58 being baptized in Jesus' name. Another 55 receiving the Holy Ghost. I was in Madagascar a few weeks ago, our third largest field. What a wonderful opportunity to preach to 15,000 people gathered for their national conference. 46 ministers ordained. When we preached at the end, we would turn the service over to a national evangelist to give the altar call. 
hundreds would line up across the front. And he said, put a row between you and the next group. And when everybody was lined up, repenting, ready to receive, he would have all the ministers and their spouses to line up in front of each row and lay hands on them. When they finished, they would record the name and contact information of the people that received the Holy Ghost. By careful count, 2,075 were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Brother Putnam was there, Brother Richards was there. It's such a joy to hear the Malagasy people praise God. They sing with such fervor. They dance. They get excited. It, it's so encouraging. I, I wish we could get a taste of that in our general conference. The song leader, he'd be jumping up and down for all he's worth. He's going as much as he can. When he's exhausted, they bring in the next song leader. When he's exhausted, they bring the next one. Then they get the general youth president. He comes. He's pretty energetic. Then they get the ladies president. She comes. She's energetic. Then they get one of the general board members. He comes. Another general board member. Then they get the national superintendent. He's leading them. Then they get the missionary. He leads them. Then they get the regional director for Africa. And he has to come up there and dance. And then they keep looking at the corner. The international general superintendent. He's the only one left. But he's too sophisticated, so they're not going to ask him directly. But they keep worshiping, they keep jumping, they keep dancing, they keep looking over there. I looked at my wife, I said, would you like to go? No, she, she prefers me. And so I said, okay, here it goes. All right, hallelujah, let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah, go ahead, you can see it. We ought to worship, show it right now. It's real, it's happening. God is doing it. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, yes, this is apostolic revival. This is Jesus' name revival. This is 21st century. This is the United Pentecostal Church. We have a right to praise the Lord. We have a right to rejoice. We have a right to dance and shout. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Oh, yes. If the Malagasy's can worship God, we can worship God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, he's worthy. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I want to tell you, it's not just happening in Africa. Just be seated for a minute. If I were smart, I'd probably just let it go right now. But I, I want to bring it home just a little bit, just for a few minutes. I'm pretty much through. But I want, you to give you, I want to give you a little bit more to shout about. It's not just happening in Pakistan. You know, I could tell you, and it's not just the typical measurements. We could talk about Compassion Services International, which is doing humanitarian efforts. And we're some of the first responders because we've got 40,000 churches on the ground that can distribute instantly. We could talk about New Beginnings doing amazing work with international adoptions. We could talk, you already heard about the Youth Congress. As conservatively as possible, 18,000, but we really know there was another thousand or two more of Pentecostal young people dressed modestly, gender distinction. They're not wanting to please the world. They're saving up money and doing fundraisers all year long to come to church. Something right is happening when 18,000 teenagers sacrifice to come to church for a week, don't tell me everybody's compromising. I know there's some compromise, but we are the people of the name, and we're not going to change. We're not going to give up. We're not going to let go. And we have a generation of young people and young ministers who are just as strong as anybody else. You heard Brother Cunningham give miracles. I'll just say, Quebec 2010, a preteen girl who was crippled. The doctor said she would never walk. Two weeks after we prayed her, for her, she was walking completely. 2011, Alaska, 24-year-old girl born with severely crossed eyes, surgery at age 6 that made it even worse. After 18 years, God instantly healed her. 2012, while the word was going for Jackson, Tennessee camp meeting, a woman with a deaf ear instantly, the ear popped and she began to hear. 2013, I was preaching in a little home mission church, Lake Havasu City, um, uh, Arizona. Almost everybody in the church was in recovery or needing to be in recovery. Three of them received the Holy Ghost. That's a miracle to see people delivered in our society in a small home mission church setting. I had the privilege of preaching in the four largest cities of the U.S. this year. Just so happened, New York City, there's great revival. Last year, I did the dedication for that beautiful church in Long Island. I preached for Brother Davis. And then in Brooklyn, down in the heart of Brooklyn, for Brother Mitchell, one of the congresswomen in attendance had received the Holy Ghost in his church. These are powerful churches of hundreds and thousands of believers of every race in the heart of the New York metro area. We are having strategic revivals not accidental revivals but intentionally planting churches in hard areas or strategic areas and we're seeing results Los Angeles I got to participate in the 100 year anniversary of the Arroyo Seco camp meeting what a joy in that outdoor service to see people baptized in Jesus name just like they were 100 years ago preached in Chicago you're going to hear from Rick Gonzalez raising up a church in a tough area of town former gang members it's nice to have somebody like that as your personal bodyguard as you're being escorted to the platform Houston, Texas. I preached there. Do you realize we have well over 100 established churches? If you count the preaching points and the daughter works, there are three sections of South Texas and probably two of Texas that come into that metro area. We would have approximately 200 works total in the greater Houston metro area. We are making a difference. Don't say the church is being defeated. Don't say we're not having revival. Probably nobody here in this arena is saying that. But if the thought ever crossed your mind, we are the people of the name of Jesus. I preached in Washington, D.C. What a privilege to see us purchase that building, the first property inside the D.C., the district itself, within view of the nation's capital, we have an established United Pentecostal church that's planting daughter works throughout the city, as well as strong churches in the suburbs. Not only that, 
My focus, of course, is the UPCI. But I've preached for a few in other apostolic gatherings hosted or approved by UPCI ministers in places like Los Angeles, Chicago, District of Columbia, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Hartford, Connecticut. I'm not just preaching for anybody and everybody, but people who are desiring an apostolic emphasis. There are people who have our same doctrine, the same lifestyle and dress commitments in the apostolic movement. And I'm preaching for them. And there's an open door. They're asking us to send Urshan graduate school instructors to train their ministers and their board members. They're asking us to send Pentecostal publishing house representatives with our literature to their conferences. I was sitting there with a group of those ministers and their spouses. And one of them, and we were at, a, at a lunch, and one of them spoke up and he said, Brother Bernard, as you know, many organizations are backsliding. And even some of our own organizations are backsliding. But we look to the UPCI to stand strong because we know the UPCI will stand for apostolic identity. And that stirred my soul. And so as I come to a close, Acts 15, 14, the first general conference. It was the first general conference of the United Apostolic Pentecostal Church International, lowercase, not incorporated. But it was the first general conference of the United Apostolic Pentecostal Church International. They voted to let Gentiles join the church. It's pretty shocking, but they did it. And Bishop James got up and he said, Simon Peter has told us how God visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Something stirred within me when I was preparing this message, and I thought, we are those people. We have a few Jewish believers here, but 99% of us are Gentiles. We are actually the people they voted in at the first general conference. We are the people of the name. And you know, when I get to heaven, I've often thought, who would I like to talk to first? Paul wrote a lot of letters. I remember Brother Harry Sism telling me, and I was traveling behind the Iron Curtain before the fall of communism, Brother Sism with his dry wit, Brother Bernard, it's so wonderful that you're a writer, because if they arrest you and put you in jail, your ministry will just go right on. Ha, 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 ha. How wonderful. Thank you, Brother Sism. I know you're here. I appreciate your support. So maybe I would talk to Paul. What was it like to write inspired scripture? What was it like to preach in Athens to those philosophers and match wits and quote, quote their own poets against them? What was it like to know Greek philosophy and challenge them on their home turf? You know, what was it like to cast out demons in, in Ephesus? What was it like? Or the apostle Peter, any preacher worth his salt, would love to know what was it like to preach the first sermon and all the other apostles, the whole general board standing with you saying amen and 3,000 people converted that day what was it like? but I got to thinking I've got it all wrong I really feel honestly and, and I'm almost embarrassed to say this but I'll, I'll draft in Brother Jones, Brother Mooney, Brother Gleason in the reference I believe those apostles I believe that Bishop James will come and say, what was it like to preside over the last day church? The last year or two before the coming of the Lord. What was it like, Brother Jones, to preach overseas in Zambia to those people? What was it like to minister? Now, I, I never had that opportunity. I don't know what it was like. What was it like to be in Madagascar? I, I hear what you're telling me, but I never saw 15,000 Malagasy speaking in tongues and dancing across and singing in harmony. What was it like? I believe the early church is talking to the United Pentecostal Church, to the assemblies of the Lord Jesus Christ, to all other believers who love His name and say, you are the people of the name in these last days let's stand together something is stirring within me 
I believe God wants to confirm His Word on this first night. I'm not noted for long altar calls. I'm noted for getting straight to the point. If there's a preacher here or spouse, you feel challenged. And I'm not saying everybody has to come. I don't, I don't really care who comes. But if you feel challenged that God is calling you to do something in your city that's never been done before, calling you to renew and affirm your identity in a Holy Ghost-filled way, you feel a tug to pray, I want you to come right now. And while you're doing that, if someone needs healing, I want you to come. If someone needs the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, I want you to come. If someone needs deliverance, please come. If someone needs a personal renewal, we'll be sensitive. We'll pray with you. I want you to come. I believe God will confirm His Word. I believe there will be healings as a result of this service. I believe God will give fresh anointing to somebody here today. Let's not be quick to leave, but all across this building, here's what I'm asking you. Let's pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, church, all across the building. Find a place to pray and find somebody to pray with. And let's call on the name of Jesus. Hakarabahas. Sweetest name, sweetest name, sweetest name. I know something about. 
something about the name Jesus. Something about the name Jesus. And I realize it is the sweetest thing. Oh, I know. I know. Oh, I love the name. Oh, how I love the name Jesus. Oh, how I love the name Jesus. And I realize 